Good morning and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, I'm Andrew Schwartz. I'm Vice President for External Relations here at CSIS, and I'm joined by my colleagues who I'll introduce to you in a minute. Um, this briefing will be available later on Facebook today. CSIS has a Facebook page, which I urge all of you to visit. It's also available um, video and audio and transcript on CSIS.org. Um, and with that, we'll get started. Uh, also for you iTunes users, um, this will be on uh, the Beyond Campus section of iTunes University. Um, my colleagues Andrew Cutchins, uh, Sharon Squassoni, and Janusz Bogajski are some of the top experts in the world um, with this region. Um, and they've got a lot to say about various things uh, that are associated with this visit. Um, in addition, um, you'll find before you a, 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 an, an example of our critical questions, and this is uh, Sharon Squassoni's um, critical questions on the Nuclear Security Summit. Uh, this will also be at CSIS.org. With that, I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague, Dr. Andrew Cutchins, who directs our Russia program. Thanks very much, Andrew. It's a great pleasure to be here, uh, and thanks for, uh, for joining us this morning for our, uh, our briefing. <clears throat> and I promise I won't... Uh, uh, talk about uh, my personal over-under on Tiger Woods' performance in the Masters coming up this week. Now, the, um, uh, the Start One uh, Replacement Treaty, which is going to be uh, signed in Prague on Thursday, uh, I want to beware of overselling the importance of this, of this agreement, but it is, it is really significant for uh, the U.S.-Russia relationship, the so-called reset in the U.S.-Russia relationship, and also uh, President Obama's ambitious goals for nuclear security and, and further reductions in, in uh, uh, nuclear, nuclear weapons. Um, I don't want to oversell it, but a long journey begins with the first step, and if you didn't have this first step, then pretty much both of those agendas would be uh, severely, severely uh, hampered. And it was extremely important that uh, uh, this agreement be reached before the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in May. Uh, as well as, of course, the nuclear summit coming up here in Washington next week, which I'm sure my colleague Sharon will talk, talk more about. Um, <clears throat> you know, about a month ago, it's also this, the agreement is also important for President Obama's political capital, both domestically and, and more so inter internationally. You know, when he was first elected, my sense was that this guy had a chance to be <clears throat> either one of the greatest presidents in, in American history because of the circumstances or an unsuccessful uh, one-term president. And about a month ago, it was looking more like the, uh, the former than the latter. And with the, uh, the combination of the, uh, the health care bill passing and the uh, Start One Replacement Treaty, uh, he's uh, looking considerably more successful in this political capital. Is, again, not only important here at home, but it's also extremely important for him abroad and how he's viewed by other international, international leaders. Now, for the U.S.-Russia relationship, which I'll talk about uh, mostly in my, my few minutes, uh, for the reset, uh, there have been three key uh, issues on security relations that have been driving the Obama administration's desire to improve relations with, uh, with Moscow. The first and most important has been Iran and the, uh, the, uh, the urgency of, uh, of their nuclear weapons uh, program. The second has been Afghanistan and the much larger bet that the Obama administration has placed or higher priority the Obama administration has placed on winning the war in Afghanistan and therefore the, uh, the role the Russians play in, in providing uh, supply and transit of uh, materials, both lethal and non-lethal, to our troops in theater. And the third uh, is, of course, the, uh, the nuclear security agenda. Uh, which, without uh, making progress with, with Russia, is, uh, uh, is impos impossible to move forward on. I think there's no question as we look at uh, uh, you know, the 15 months or 14 months since the Obama administration has taken power that the U.S.-Russian relationship has improved considerably. Now, it's improved from a, uh, a very low point. It's a very low bar. In fact, if the, if the relationship had not improved, which it was basically frozen uh, at the end of the Bush administration after the war in Georgia, um, uh, there was the danger, literally, of a of a new cold new cold war, and um, amongst the achievements, one of them which is not talked about uh, so much, and maybe I should knock on wood when I talk about this, is the fact that there has not been another war in Georgia uh, in the last uh, year and a half since the war in August of two thousand and eight. And I know that uh, my colleagues in the Defense Department, the National Security Council, and the State Department, they spend a lot of time on this issue and ensuring that this does not happen. 
And uh, I think when they got a call in the middle of the night uh, a week ago about the tragedy of the, uh, the bombing on the Moscow Metro, I think one of their first thoughts might have been whether there, another war had started in, in Georgia. So I under, underline that it's a significant achievement, uh, but one which is not often talked about. The relationship has also been broadened um, uh, considerably with the establishment of the, uh, the, uh, the commission between uh, Secretary of State Clinton and Foreign Minister Lavrov and the 16 working groups. And that's, that's uh, important. But there, most importantly, probably, aside from no war in Georgia, is that there has been progress on the three key security drivers, Iran, Afghanistan, and uh, nuclear security in the relationship. As long as we have fairly modest expectations about what we can get out of the relationship with, with Russia, we're uh, less likely to be dis disappointed. And that's been my line cons consistently for the last 15, 15 months. Because particularly when you look at these three issues, our interests are not exactly fully aligned. Now, I'm not going to talk about Iran and, and Afghanistan so much. Let's just look at the START One Treaty. When we looked at the reset button uh, 15 months ago, uh, this was talked about as the low-lying fruit. This was going to be the so-called easy achievement. Well, uh, the agreement uh, was a little bit more complicated to, uh, to reach than expected, and uh, there was danger uh, a month ago. Uh, I felt that uh, the low-lying fruit might actually become the poison fruit of the reset, but that's not been the case. Now, why, um, why the length of the, ne the negotiations? Well, you know, first of all, uh, you know, for the presidents to agree on this in, in uh, April of 2009 and try to, and try to reach the, uh, the deadline of December 5, uh, 2009, the expiration of the, the START 1 agreement, that's awfully ambitious uh, in the first place. Two, I think the Russians viewed that they had some leverage uh, with the Obama administration. I think they view that uh, for the Obama administration, perhaps this agreement was uh, more important uh, for them than it was for Moscow, and that... Uh, uh, led them to press hard in the, the tail end of the negotiations, which for three or four months it seemed like we were 97 percent there and never quite getting beyond 97 percent. You know, three, uh, and maybe this is the most important, this agreement, like any kind of agreement about security cooperation with, between Moscow and Washington, it brings the, into the debate the whole relationship itself. And I just want to remind you that for the Russians, they are still operating under a military doctrine which identifies the United States uh, and the West, but principally the United States and NATO, is the number one risk or threat to their, their security. So they're in a, our strategic outlooks are quite, quite different. I mean, we, uh, the United States, I think we really have moved on from the Cold War, and we're looking at a different threat environment. And for the Russians, uh, it's not quite in sync, and that's a problem. And I think if you talk to the, uh, the Americans that were involved in the negotiations, it was clear that uh, some political forces and military and security forces were um, exercising or obstructing the agreement in the, uh, in the tail end. But we got it. The other point I would make is that for the role of nuclear weapons uh, is there's an asymmetry for Washington and Moscow. For the, for the Russians, because of the deterioration of the conventional weapons projection uh, capability, nuclear weapons are more important in their overall military doctrine. For us, the reverse is true, probably, to some, to some extent. Uh, and I think that uh, gets to the, the, the question of, of how, how possible or how difficult future agreements are going to be getting to a next round of reductions with, with the Russians, which I think are going to be considerably tougher and we can talk about more. Let me just say a word about the, uh, the Prague trip, because it's my understanding that uh, in the meeting between Mr. Obama and Mr. Medvedev in Prague, the principal issue that's going to be discussed are going to be sanctions on Iran. Um, and it'll be important to work out something uh, closer to uh, 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 an agreement with the Russians about the language in the, in the uh, areas on sanctions uh, before negotiating with the Chinese who will be, Hu Jintao will be in town here next week for the, uh, for the nuclear summit. Um, broadly speaking, if I have about a minute left, okay. Um, the strategy of the Obama administration, I think, has been to try to convince the Russians that, you know, it probably is in your interest to have a better relationship with us, Washington, than one with Tehran, if you think about, think about your interests, and to think about your interests somewhat, somewhat differently. And if we aren't able to uh, reach a meeting of the minds on, uh, on sanctions, you know, then other things, uh, for example, possible WTO accession, a civilian nuclear one two three agreement, even the ratification of start start one all those things are really going to be jeopardized uh, on Capitol Hill where there's not a whole lot of sympathy uh, towards the uh, towards the Russians um, the Russian strategy consistently on uh, on the Iranian 
uh, nuclear issue and sanctions has been to uh, try to find a way to um, appear that they are cooperating with uh, the United States uh, and, and our allies on this while not having to make a hard decision about selling Tehran uh, down, the, uh, down the road. Um, there was a big hullabaloo in the, in the fall when Mr. Medvedev uh, said that the Russians are not categorically opposed to uh, sanctions on Iran. I thought that was completely overplayed because look, the Russians have already supported three rounds of sanctions against Iran in the, in the, in the UN. Um, now lastly, I think the administration would like to, in, in, from a strategic sense, uh, particularly in the reset with the Russians, is try to regain some leverage uh, in the U.S.-Russia-China relationship. Uh, and I think it is worth, I'll leave you with this thought in my opening remarks, while I think it's appropriate to have modest expectations about, um, about the reset with the Russians, when I look at the three key security issues driving the relationship, Iran, Afghanistan, and nuclear security, I would conclude that probably Moscow's position on all three of those sets of issues are closer to us uh, than our Beijing. And maybe that's something to think about. Thanks. That I'd like to introduce my colleague uh, Sharon Squassoni. Sharon uh, is the director and senior fellow for our uh, proliferation program, and she's just joined us uh, from Carnegie, and we're very happy to have her. And this is her first briefing here at CSIS. Thanks, Andrew. I guess I'm the functional specialist here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the nuclear security summit that will take place in Washington next Monday. Um, Andrew. Uh, mentioned the sort of three-pronged agenda that President Obama laid out last April in Prague. There's uh, nuclear arms control and disarmament, nonproliferation, uh, and nuclear security. This April summit next week takes place just a month before the review conference of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. That happens every five years. President Obama needs a big win. He needs something <laughs> to uh, gain more cooperation and collaboration from other members of the treaty. And so I think the Nuclear Security Summit was designed with that in mind to have something uh, that uh, would be splashy, uh, that would have style, but also have substance just one month before this um, important review conference. So what's going to happen? <clears throat> We're going to have 44, total 44 heads of state. We'll have Hu Jintao from um, China and Medvedev, uh, Manmohar Singh from, uh, from India and uh, the Prime Minister Ghilani from Pakistan and uh, Bibi Netanyahu from Israel. Iran and North Korea will not uh, show up and that's probably for the best. <laughs> there will be a state dinner. Um, or a heads of state dinner uh, the night of April 12th, and then uh, there will be two plenary sessions on the 13th that will focus on both national measures and on international cooperation to enhance nuclear security. Um, more importantly, this is this is a big opportunity. It, I guess not since 1949 has there been such a, a big gathering of heads of state. And so, as Andrew mentioned, this will be an opportunity to discuss uh, sanctions on Iran, uh, other pressing bilateral issues, and of course some of these nuclear nonproliferation issues one month before that conference. On substance, this is a little trickier. And one of the questions that I often get is, what is nuclear security? What is this going to cover? Um, not everyone agrees on uh, which material poses the biggest threat or how big the threat is. And so one of the functions of this conference will be to uh, obtain greater agreement. Let's start with a couple facts and then I'll, I'll leave um, a lot of time for your questions. Since 1993, there have been more than 1,600 illicit nuclear trafficking incidents that have been reported uh, to the IAEA. Not all of these have been serious. Not all of them have involved weapons usable material. But what it demonstrates is that there's a market out there. There, there is interest in trafficking in this material. This summit. Uh, when, you, when you look at the kinds of material, you can look at things in weapons stockpiles, you can look at weapons usable material, which is not just stuff in weapons and stockpiles, but also in the civilian nuclear energy sector, in research reactors. 
Um, the third category of material is radioactive materials that you find everywhere in hospitals. These are sources that are used for uh, cancer treatments, those kinds of things. So some, particularly our European allies, believe we should focus on those radioactive materials because they're not well guarded, they're a target of opportunity for terrorists. You can't make a nuclear weapon with them, however, but you can make uh, what we call a, a dirty bomb, a radioactive uh, weapon, and many experts agree that that is what terrorists would probably seek. Nonetheless, this security summit next week will focus on the weapons usable material. There is enough material, depending on who you talk to, for between 120,000 weapons or 300,000 weapons. That range demonstrates right there that we need to do more. We need to exchange more information. There needs to be a lot more transparency. And this is uh, a job that is for all countries, not just nuclear weapon states, not just nuclear weapon holders like uh, India, Pakistan, and Israel, uh, but for all states. And so going back to the agreement on what the threat is, one of the functions of the summit will be to get greater agreement on the fact that there is a threat, to get all countries to say, yes, we agree, this is a problem. Uh, so the White House hopes for four things, uh, that countries will be engaged, they will be more aware, they will pledge to do something about this, they will adopt best practices, and they will provide assistance uh, to other countries. The non-governmental organizations, uh, that community hopes for a little bit more. Don't just focus on the existing regime, but do more. Actually, uh, you know, consolidate, maybe eliminate these global stockpiles of material. I am going to um, leave your specific questions about what countries um, can do for the Q&A section, um, but this will be, even if, I, I just want to close with, even if um, there is a, a communique that is full of uh, flowery language about each country's <laughs> commitments, even that will be helpful in this, um, in this effort against nuclear terrorism, primarily because we all know what to do, but we're lacking the political will to do it and get it done in the shortest amount of time. Thanks. Thank you, Sharon. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Janusz Bogajski. Janusz is the Laurentius Labrantiatis Chair in Southeast Europe Studies. He's also the director of our new European Democracies Project, and he's a senior fellow in our Europe program. And uh, Janusz is going to talk about uh, uh, this aspect of the trip. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Andrew. Uh, good morning and welcome, everyone. I'm going to be exceptionally brief, and I'm going to focus on uh, President Obama's meeting with uh, the Central European leaders, which is planned in, in, in Prague, I believe, Thursday evening for a dinner. And I would say this uh, to begin with. Paradoxically, uh, President Obama's planned meeting uh, with 11 leaders from the new, uh, dem new democracies, the new NATO allies, is intended to demonstrate that relations with Central Eastern Europe have not been reset or have not been downgraded, which is the way it's perceived in some parts of the region. In other words, despite attempts to upgrade relations with Russia, as Andy's been saying, uh, primarily through the START Treaty, the U.S. will not, according to the Obama administration, let me make five points here. One, weaken its commitments to NATO security guarantees. Two, withdraw militarily from Europe. Three, agree to any redivision of the continent into blocks or spheres of influence, the continent meaning Europe, the old continent. Four, close the door to further NATO enlargement eastwards. And five, make any grand bargains with Moscow over the heads of former Soviet satellites in Central Eastern Europe. However, I would say the very fact that such reassurances need to be emphasized indicates that several capitals in the region remain troubled, not just about Russia's aspirations in the neighborhood, but about US and NATO policy towards Russia. 
For this reason, there are several landmark developments ahead that will prove significant for the new allies, and I think these are going to be discussed at the dinner. Um, countries that are seeking not only reassurance but an upgrade of NATO's security commitments. Let me mention three. First of all, the framing of NATO's new strategic concept, which is in the works, which is being worked out as we speak, uh, and how Russia is interpreted and depicted in the document. Secondly, NATO's summit in Lisbon uh, in November, and what commitments are made to enlargement, mutual defense, uh, and NATO's role over the coming decade. There's a huge debate over what role NATO is playing. Is it a global NATO? Is it NATO back to basics? Or how can the two be combined? And there's different views on how this, uh, how this should be uh, structured. And three, the contours of the new missile defense system. Uh, remember, President Obama canceled the Bush version, but he's now talked about his own version, his own alternative version, uh, to which several countries in Central Eastern Europe have already quickly signed up, including Romania, possibly Bulgaria, certainly the Poles and the Czechs are interested. Uh, the question there is exactly uh, how this will, will be an integrated NATO system, uh, how will Russia and if Russia will be included in the planned system as the NATO Secretary General has been offering over the past few weeks. It is worth remembering in this context that one of the reasons Warsaw and Prague initially signed on to the Bush version of the missile defense was not so much defense against Iran, but to try and establish a closer bilateral link with the United States, bilateral military link with the United States, at a time when doubts over NATO solidarity were growing, uh, as several West European countries had reset their relations with Russia to quite warm, if not very warm, <laughs> which troubled some countries in the region. So uh, to summarize or to conclude, let me say this, that the Central European states bordering Russia are concerned about Russia's ambitions in countries such as Ukraine, uh, Moldova, and Georgia. Andrew mentioned the possibility of another war in Georgia. It's not to be discounted. Uh, and the pressure that Moscow can exert uh, even on their own security, um, it, particularly with the most more vulnerable uh, three Baltic states. As proof of NATO's Article 5 uh, defense guarantees, they have pushed the alliance to prepare for contingency plans for their defense, uh, which is now evidently taking place for the three Baltic states, to stage more regular exercises, not just air exercises, in the eastern part of NATO. Um, Russia has staged quite, uh, I would say, uh, provocative exercises last year next to the Polish and Baltic borders, and NATO did not respond. And even to position some NATO infrastructure on their territories. This is why the, uh, this month, actually, the, the uh, deployment of a battery of Patriot missiles with a small American contingent in Poland, northern Poland, uh, is considered extremely important because it, in, in some way it ties NATO closer to the defense of these, uh, of these countries. They also, last point, they also want greater clarity as to how NATO countries interpret Article 5, uh, which is subject to some debate, uh, and proof that the alliance is an effective deterrence policy. Let, let me stop there, and if you have any questions, happy to answer. Great. We'll open it up to questions now. Questions. Juliana. Thank you. Juliana Goldman with Bloomberg News. I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit. You talked about the political capital that the president has now um, and, and just the capital he has with European leaders because of the START Treaty and how that will play out with other issues, uh, other nuclear issues uh, this year and, and looking forward. <clears throat> it's a great question. It's hard to, to, uh, to quantify. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I just think that uh, uh, given the, the success that the administration has experienced in, in the last month, um, you know, international leaders, whether they're in Europe or, or elsewhere, I think they have to regard the administration uh, as one which is, um, I mean, there was, a, there was a broad tendency, I, th I think, and kind of an increasing tendency, understandably, given the difficulty of the first year of the Obama administration to sort of, you know, well, there is weak. It's discounted, and this is not. Uh, this, you know, we may not be. We not be. May not be dealing with this guy, uh, you know, in 2012 or and and beyond. I think that calculation has to look uh, different. 
uh, now uh, than than just a just a month 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 ago. How it's going to uh, you know play out on the um, well the most imminent question is how it's going to play out on the the uh, the, san the sanctions on, on on Iran, and I think that uh, behind the scenes the administration has been. <clears throat> uh, getting closer to a meeting of the minds, not only with the Russians, uh, but also to some extent with the, with the Chinese. And I would point to the fact that Hu Jintao decided to come to the nuclear summit next next week, as uh, you know, this may not be sort of you know direct. You can't directly tie a um, a correlation necessarily between you know victory in healthcare and the Start One Treaty and that. But the fact that he's coming here sort of bolsters that image that this is a president which is. Uh, uh, um, you know, looking looking more more successful. Uh, how successful they're going to be with the uh, the sanctions on on Iran, and, and I don't think anybody in the Obama administration has any illusions that uh, whatever sanctions are are leveled on the Iranians, that uh, this is uh, you know going to solve solve the problem. Um, but we'll just have to uh, to wait wait and see. Maybe some of my colleagues have some other comments yeah. on that. Uh, Christy Parsons from the Chicago Tribune. Could you follow up just a bit? What what say, what are we likely to see? Are there will there be developments this week in the coming week on sanctions on Iran, and how would they become evident? What what are you expecting? In a lot of ways, we're in the same place we've always been on sanctions on Iran. Um, over the past few years, uh, we've tried to target sanctions uh, so that they didn't affect um, the Iranian people as a whole, all the while knowing that the kinds of things uh, which would really get the Iranians' attention um, are the kinds of things that hurt. <laughs> so uh, restrictions on refined petroleum products into Iran. Uh, they not only hurt the Iranian people, but uh, they hurt Iran's trading partners. You know, it's easy for the U.S. to talk about sanctions. We don't have a big trading relationship with Iran. It's a lot harder uh, with Russia and China, particularly China. So the effort right now, um, since Iran has really refused to comply with uh, UN Security Council resolutions and, and even the kind of olive branch offering in, in the fall, to uh, get back to the to the negotiating table, um, we're engaged in an effort to get another round of UN Security Council resolutions. And the issue is, will will China um, at at best support if uh, or or a, a not so bad outcome would be if they just abstained? Uh, and and how much would will Russia? Uh, support a new round of sanctions. There are a lot of things that, that can be done outside of the UN Security Council, and a lot of those measures that deal with uh, transactions at banks, et cetera, uh, have been helpful. But Iran shows no sign of either returning to the negotiating table or halting its enrichment program. And so um, <clears throat> I think we're in a slightly better position. The Chinese have, have shown a little bit more flexibility. Uh, up until now, they have been sort of taking a principled stand against sanctions. Uh, but we'll have to see. This security summit next um, week really does offer an opportunity to talk on the margins. This is what happens at, at major summits. Um, and so I think the hope is there, as well as this meeting uh, in Prague, is that we can bring you know, first Russia and then China along. Um, I don't think we're going to see sanctions on uh, the uh, <coughs> energy sector, oil, oil and gas sector, and I, I'm skeptical we're going to see sanctions also on on uh, uh, arms exports uh, to Iran. I think both the uh, the Russians and the Chinese are uh, not going to sign on that for 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 different reasons. Um, but it looks like there is a, a decent likelihood of uh, more restrictions in the bank, the banking sector, and try to restrict the access that uh, some of the political leadership and political economic elite has to uh, has to to uh, uh, to, cap to capital. Now, one of the one of the positive uh, uh, things that I uh, took note of about two weeks ago was the report that actually the Russians and the Chinese had made a, a demarche uh, to the uh, uh, to the Iranians. Um, about their uh, failures to be more forthcoming with the IAEA 
on their nuclear nuclear weapons program. That was a little bit lost because it was the, the same week in which it was announced that uh, the START one treaty was, was basic, basically agreed to. But uh, in a debriefing at the National, National Security Council, um, uh, that was they pointed to that as a as quite a quite a quite a positive positive sign. Now it was kind of interesting. They uh, weren't they weren't able to say to what whether this uh, they expected that it was a that it was a Russian initiative um, to the to the Chinese, but uh, nobody was quite uh, quite quite sure about that, um, which again kind of raises the, the interesting aspect of the kind of the, how, the, how the, the Russian and Chinese relationship. To what extent are they together, and to what extent are we breaking them off somewhat? I think it's clear that on Iran, that uh, the Russians are closer to us than the uh, uh, than the Chinese. The Chinese are. If I could just add very briefly, uh, in terms of uh, Russian policy towards Iran, it's very ambiguous. I would say, on the one hand, they don't want Iran to develop a nuclear capability. On the other hand, they don't want a U.S.-Iranian rapprochement. Because in terms of their zero-sum calculations, greater U.S. influence in the region means lesser Russian influence in the region. So in a way, it suits them to have, for us, a little bit of a problem in the region with Iran, not one that gets out of hand and descends into some sort of uh, strike against uh, Iranian nuclear facilities or, or what we suspect are nuclear facilities, or for them to develop a nuclear device that could be deployable, that could be, that could be used. So it's this ambiguous position, and, and we see the same, I think, in Afghanistan. In other words, they want to help us, they don't want us to lose, but they don't want us to win either. Um, so it's a sort of tying down American resources, uh, restricting American influence, and using themselves as a, as a potential mediator and problem solver. That's part of the strategy. Margaret. Thanks, Margaret Tolive with McClatchy. Um, it sounds like you're all saying we should look at the Prague trip as in the sort of larger context of all these things are going to be happening over the course of the next month. So in that vein, two questions. Uh, we're looking at the release of the NPR tomorrow, uh, the White House says. And I want to ask you how that all fits in with this. And, and then also, um, India, Pakistan, they'll both be at uh, uh, participating in the summit. And I'm curious what sort of interplay between those countries you'll be watching over the next month, and also how President Karzai's uh, recent comments in Afghanistan you think will factor into the meetings in Prague and all the discussions in terms of what to expect. I'll start on the NPR. <laughs> the Nuclear Posture Review, not National Public Radio. Um, <clears throat> the long-awaited Nuclear Posture Review. Um, what this has done in the past, it's a congressionally mandated document. It, it sets out the role of nuclear weapons in U.S. national security strategy. And um, it's no uh, coincidence that uh, the Bush administration's uh, nuclear posture review basically said, well, we can go down to, I guess it was 2000 warheads, and that's what you saw in the SORT treaty, the, the Moscow treaty. And so uh, the nuclear posture review this time around should, um, uh, you know, it'll talk about what are the primary uses of nuclear weapons, what are levels that we can live with. There, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot that will be very surprising, but it should support what the Obama administration uh, is doing with both New START and follow-on uh, negotiations there. On India and Pakistan, you know, <clears throat> Pakistan is probably, even though the Nuclear Security Summit is not um, designed and hopes to avoid actually pointing fingers at any single country, but obviously the issue of nuclear security is a big one in Pakistan, uh, both the security of nuclear material and the security of their nuclear weapons. Um, I don't think we'll – I, I can't imagine we're going to see too much uh, – uh, too much progress between India and Pakistan at the summit, but I think it's a good thing that uh, both are are at least attending. Andy, do you want? Well, maybe well, one comment uh, about the uh, uh, the administration's going to zero agenda, which is uh, uh, Secretary of Defense Gates said last week is not anything that's going to happen happen soon. But I mean, one of the, the fundamental problems about uh, the uh, that that agenda is that is enlisting the support of other countries with it, beginning with the Russians, 
and then the Chinese, and then the Indians and the Pak Pakistanis, and so on, so on down the line. I mean, uh, nobody else in the world, no other nation state in the world, which is a, uh, uh, an officially recognized or unofficially recognized uh, nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons state, is particularly enthusiastic about it because the United States enjoys, I mean, particularly for the, for the Russians, I mean, here's, here's the rub. Uh, for the Russians, their concern is that uh, uh, the combination of their eroding, the tremendous erosion of their conventional weapon, weapons forces, plus uh, the uh, uh, deteriorating numbers on, uh, on offense, offensive forces, plus uh, the U.S. Uh, conventional weapons development in which uh, their weapons which are close to near nuclear capabilities, plus the development of, uh, of missile defenses, all of that from the Russian standpoint, the Russians are not alone in this, see this as potentially making the world safe for American military intervention whenever, whenever uh, we want. And that's a, that's a core tension and, uh, and challenge you know, for, the, for the agenda. Uh, and uh, it's pretty easy to understand when you know, we are spending 55% of uh, the world expenditures on global arms and telling the rest of the world that you know, we should be moving very, very aggressively down in their nuclear weapons, which for them is sort of the asymm asymmetric um, balancer. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty tough nut to, nut, nut to crack. Uh, and it's going to become more telling as we uh, get beyond the Start One Replacement Treaty. On the, the, uh, um, the Karzai comments, wow. Um, so <laughs> sometimes with some, some of our friends, uh, you know, friends like that who needs enemies. But uh, sorry, we are on, we are on, uh, on, on TV. I mean, this is the, the crux of the problem in Af Af Afghanistan. Uh, and... Uh, if indeed, Mr. is it true that Mr. Karzai is going to be at the nuclear summit in Washington next week? Sorry? Well, that was a reference to the May 12th separate uh, meeting. Okay. Well, I mean, obviously. Which is still on as of today. <laughs> That's what Robert, said, Robert Gibbs said this morning at the gaggle. Okay. Um, well, obviously, one of the core problems we face in Af Afghanistan is the, uh, the, uh, the, the competitive instincts of Pac Pac Pakistan and India. Uh, mm. And so I, I would have to think that uh, with both of the leaders here next week that that may be a point of discussion, uh, hopefully. Um, with the upcoming, uh, uh, the planned offensive in, in, in Kandahar, um, you know, uh, Ambassador Eikenberry was here re recently, and, and his comment was, you know, this is one part political, excuse me, one part military and five parts political. Um, the one part uh, military, uh, the, the Afghan leadership is likely to support. The five parts political, big, big question mark. Welcome to the bipartisan, non-ideologically driven Center for Strategic International <laughs> Studies. Right over here. Francine. We call the museum. Francine Kiefer from the Christian Science Monitor. Um, I'd like to go back to the reset with Russia subject. And could you talk a little bit about um, the political aspect of it and whether you see any relationship developing between Obama and Medvedev, whether that could cause a split between Medvedev and Putin in terms of direction of the country? Just where do you see the politics going and Obama perhaps finding a better friend in Medvedev than he may find in Putin? Well, I think there's no question that uh, uh, President Obama uh, finds it uh, easier uh, and more pleasant to interact with, with uh, Mr. Medvedev than he does with Mr. Mr. Putin. Um, it's a, uh, a, tricky, a tricky point. Um, on foreign policy and security issues, uh, my view has been, and uh, in my discussions with administration officials, uh, confirm this, that uh, there really isn't any, any space between them on foreign policy and, and, and security issues uh, that they see that is, that is significant. Um, what is significant is, you know, and I've observed this myself simply uh, from, you know, meeting with the, the two of them separately, you know, they really do have different, uh, you know, outlooks on uh, the development of, uh, of Russia. Uh, they talk about it very, very differently. Um, Medvedev, you know, the fact that Medvedev is a lot younger, uh, that he does have experience in the, in the private sector. Um, 
uh, he does uh, have what we would call a more liberal um, uh, outlook on, on things than does Mr. Putin. It's impossible to, uh, to miss that. Now, what's going to happen politically in Russia <laughs> is uh, impossible to, to, uh, to predict. Um, I mean, I would be very, very wary of uh, making any, any bets against, uh, against Vladimir Putin, and I would be very, very wary about um, being viewed overtly uh, as trying to support Mr. Medvedev domestically at the expense of, of Mr. Mr. Putin. Um, we may have uh, more potential to uh, endanger Mr. Medvedev than we have actually to, uh, to help. Uh, we and most, most other countries don't have a particularly uh, good track record in trying to intervene in other countries' domestic politics. And I think particularly in the case of, of Russia, where it is so, so, the issue of sovereignty is so sensitive uh, that that has to be handled with the utmost care. Uh, Emily Cadet with CQ Roll Call. And I was just wondering if you could talk about the role of Congress, and particularly on the START Treaty ratification, but also just in general how much they can be an obstacle to what the White House is trying to do when it comes to Iran sanctions and some of these other issues high on the agenda. That's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> um, Congress can obviously be a big obstacle when it comes to nuclear arms control. Uh, and that is because uh, on the START Treaty, uh, the Senate has to consent to ratification on the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which is something else that this administration uh, supports. Uh, they can also uh, be an obstacle there. I think that we haven't yet, I mean, we've seen some things from the Hill, from particular uh, senators um, expressing, um, well, expressing their views on certain issues related to this, on verification, on uh, missile defenses, on several of those things. I think the Obama administration has tried to head them off at the pass. Uh, one with a few speeches by Vice President Biden um, and a lot of money for the nuclear weapons complex, uh, which many thought would be uh, kind of a prerequisite for Senate approval um, in some of these nuclear arms control areas. Uh, but we'll see what happens with the debate on start. I don't think that there, and correct me if I'm wrong, there are too many. Th th this new START treaty is... Um, on the face of it, um, you know, incremental, not, you know, th there is nothing in there on uh, missile defense. Um, it doesn't seem from a rational perspective, technical perspective, <laughs> that uh, there are too many leaps uh, here. But, uh, you know, politics is politics, and um, there can be um, any number of uh, different bargains that can be asked for. I would say that, you know, I, I particularly was hoping that Obama would be able to do a series of um, unilateral uh, moves that wouldn't depend so much on uh, congressional approval. Um, and uh, we'll see in the coming days, particularly in the, in the next two weeks, uh, I think we'll see some more views emerging from Congress, not just on on START, but uh, on the nuclear posture review, uh, whether there's dissatisfaction there. A couple things. Uh, do you anticipate that when the President, President Obama meets with President Medvedev, that will be a meeting to sort of get the Russian sign off on Iran sanctions? Similarly, when President Hu comes here in the subsequent week, should we look at both of those meetings as potentially face-to-face -face sign off? on Iran sanctions. Do you think we're on that kind of timetable? I know it's hard to know for sure, but for those of us covering it and around it, should we consider that one of the dead central items of that agenda? Secondly, whatever happens at the Security Council, do you think it would be likely and advisable for the EU or some other organization to do another component of sanctions? Do you think Europe would be open to that? Do you think that's something we should anticipate after whatever the Security Council does or does not come up with? Lastly, almost every treaty that's been of this nature, there's been a tremendous conversation of the numbers. We haven't talked numbers at all. Is, it because, is that because the numbers aren't impressive or um, it's about something else? I know I've not through a lot, of, so I'll stop there. 
um, on the Iran question, uh, uh, I'm operating on, under the assumption that uh, that the meeting in Prague is very important to uh, to get signed off uh, with Mr. Medvedev or get that much closer to it, uh, and that the following week. Uh, the meeting with uh, Hu Jin, there'll be a meeting with Hu Jintao and the, and, the, and the Chinese. Now that may be overly ambitious, uh, but uh, um, uh, that looks to be the uh, the game the sequencing from 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 my my standpoint. The Russians are the Russians are closer to us on this. Uh, the hope has always been that the you get the Russians that'll help to bring the Chinese Chinese along. I've always kind of uh, been intrigued by the idea of let's see if. Because the, the, the Chinese traditionally have been quite happy to kind of hide behind uh, Russian opposition uh, to sanctions and Russian vocal opposition on a lot of issues, be it missile defense or NATO expansion or others that the Chinese are not uh, particularly enthusiastic about about either. Um, and in, on the Iran sanctions, what's been kind of interesting uh, this round with the Obama administration, they've been pretty uh, explicit uh, in, in uh, talking about this as on the reset, um, getting the Russians to come on board, that's the litmus test. Now, uh, if you ask them whether that's the litmus test with the, China, with the US China relationship, no, it's not. Um, which reflects, A, uh, the much greater um, leverage that uh, the Chinese have uh, in the bilateral relationship with the United States uh, than the Russians uh, in, in particular. And that's a pretty interesting and telling, I think, uh, uh, change of affairs from even just a, a few years ago, where um, the Russian support was the Russian support was viewed as you get that, then you then you've got you've got the Chinese. I think that's a that, that whole paradigm is. I, if it ever if it exactly if it if it ever existed, I think it's I think it's it's it's, it's broken. Uh, and the Chinese have shown themselves on a number of different issues over the past year to be willing to be more in front. Uh, and in opposition to to U.S. U.S. interests. Um, I'm sorry. The question on the, uh, uh, the, the 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 nuclear treaty. The numbers. The numbers. Well, Sharon, do you want to talk about the numbers? Sure, but I was going to refer to. I I, I think that there is less of less of an obsession with numbers be, because of the reason that Andy gave earlier, which is that the U.S. does not, or there are many in the U.S. that do not fear Russia as the major strategic competitor. Uh, maybe Andy can talk about the discussion in Russia over numbers. But there, there's another thing is, first, the numbers are not so low compared to what they were previously. And it also depends on what you're comparing it to. Are you comparing it to the original? and how you're counting. So, you know, is it the original START agreement that we're comparing to? Is it the Moscow SORT treaty? The White House has come out and said, well, this is, you know, 30 percent lower than the SORT levels, but in the end, do you really care? When the warheads start to get, now we're at 1550, right, 1,550, when they start to get to the 1,000 level or below, then you're really going to start to care about numbers, because then you're talking about do, do we continue to have a strategic triad? You know, are we going to still continue to have missiles and, and bombers and submarines? Um, and who else do you need to bring into the negotiations? It then becomes a multilateral arms control negotiation. And, um, you know, previous administrations were always focused on the bilateral U.S.-Russian or U.S.-Soviet uh, the Obama administration has said, yeah, we're going to pursue multilateral arms control. So the big question will be, at what point can you bring in those other players? To follow up on that, I think for the administration, uh, the most important things, one, were that we get the treaty done. Uh, with the expiration of the Start, Start One Treaty in, in December, it meant you were going to lose the entire verification and monitoring uh, uh, regime that went went along with that. So I think for the, for the Obama folks, uh, being able to uh, replace the treaty and maintain uh, a significant degree of that uh, verification and mon monitoring regime is probably the most important uh, achievement from the standpoint of, of U.S. national security with the with the treaty. Like for the Russians, the numbers are <coughs> the Russians. Uh, I mean, 
talk in over the last decade or so uh, in you know nuclear circles uh, with with Russians, you know you often uh, they can talk about getting down to a thousand weapons, and I think that seems to be a, a relatively reasonable proposition for them. It's kind of interesting how that is in this over this negotiation. This seems to be, I mean, getting to where we are with this treaty was was harder than some some expected, and I think again getting to that getting to that next step is is going to be harder uh, if we are uh, not unless we are willing to really kind of address the strategic stability relationship and talk about the role of missile defenses and include, and you can't, can't be finessed in the next round, I don't, I don't think. I'm fairly certain of that from the Russian standpoint. And also <coughs> the role of, of, uh, of long-range uh, precision-guided uh, uh, conventional munitions. Um, that's what, uh, you know, really is, again, sort of in the uh, the concern about uh, the Russian military and strategic planners and where this where this is going. Well, I think we're going to have to consider if um, well if there is no um, discernible progress on UN Security Council resolution, we're, we will, of course, consider other options. Uh, and the question is which of the European allies will be most helpful there. Um, the French have, uh, are, are espousing their, uh, their, their help, but probably it'll talking be the, big. yeah, they are talking big. Uh, and, uh, but the Germans, <laughs> Will probably, uh, in the end, be a, be a little more helpful. But I, you know, I think we we continue on the same path we've been going down, which is to uh, look at this at every single level, not just the the top level, highly political, highly visible ones. Janusz, did you want to add to that? Um, okay. Great, great. Question. I'm Carol Lee with Politico. Can you, going back to the reset, can you guys elaborate a little bit on what the recent suicide bombings mean to that effort? Um, for me, the, uh, the, the suicide bombings, especially the, uh, the bombings that took place in Moscow last Monday on the, met on the metro, uh, is a reminder uh, <coughs> that you know, Russia is probably, if you look at the United States, Europe, and Russia, uh, Russia is probably the most vulnerable of those uh, three countries, three regions, uh, to terrorist attack uh, and to the possibility of catastrophic terrorist attack. Um, and uh, whoever carried out uh, these bombings, it was a very, very powerful statement uh, to you know, undertake uh, them, you know, underneath or very close to being underneath to to uh, the former KGB building, the, uh, the the institution which has primary responsibility for the protection of the Russian people. Uh, it is a little bit sort of anal analogous to the symbolic uh, uh, import of, you know, taking out the uh, the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and, and with the aspiration of taking out the, the, cap the capital uh, as, as well. Um, the, you know, how it's going to, uh, how it's going to play out is going to, it's, it's hard, it's hard to predict. You know, on the, on the domestic polit political front, uh, in the past, over the past decade, um, there's no question that, uh, terrorist attacks have played to the favor, uh, of Mr. Putin, uh, and, and as, as a, as a, a justification uh, for the further centralization of political political power, um, etc. We have seen in response to this attack, I think, a, a considerable difference uh, uh, between Mr. Putin and Mr. Medvedev. You know, Mr. Putin has you know resorted to his usual playbook of uh, we're going to pull them all out of the sewer, like you know, taking them out of the outhouse and. That kind of that kind of very very tough talk, and we've heard seen some of that tough talk from Medvedev as well. Uh, what we've also seen from Medvedev is that you know this is a reminder that really the core problem is the 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 terrible 
socioeconomic conditions in the North Caucasus, uh, which are the driver for these groups to to attack, uh, which is not something we hear from uh, from from Mr. Mr. Putin. <coughs> Francine Kiefer again from the Monitor. So um, how could the U.S. administration assist Russia at all in the anti-terrorism fight? Obama said we stand ready to help last week. How could he do that? And would they even be, would Russia even be open to that? Can I, can I jump in? Uh, that's a very good question because the way I see the conflict in Russia is between uh, non-state terrorism, which is some of these suicide bombers, uh, and state terrorism. Uh, in other words, Russian policy in the Caucasus hasn't exactly been the same as uh, our policy in Afghanistan. In other words, for, for Russia, anti-terrorism means dealing with uh, a, a wider swath of population that you can, with no cameras present, no media present, and you can do with them what you wish. And if you, some of the brave Russian human rights activists have reported on some of the atrocities uh, by Russian servicemen, by uh, security forces in the region. It's not surprising that this is stirring even more. It's like a hornet's nest. It's, it's stirring even more cause for revenge. And it looks as though the, the, the two people that blew themselves up in the Moscow metro were so-called black widows. In other words, women whose husbands uh, or, 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 or brothers or some kinsmen were, were actually killed by Russian forces. So how can we help? Your question is how can we help Russia anti-terrorism? Uh, <laughs> maybe uh, through the example of uh, Guantanamo legal process uh, and so on and so forth to, sh to show that anti-terrorism does not mean uh, the destruction of all human rights, uh, the, the violation of all human rights in, in the North Caucasus. So I don't know directly that Russia would want us to necessarily help. What I do fear uh, that there is a foreign policy aspect to this. What, what, whether it strengthens Putin or not, domestically or not, for, on the foreign policy side, uh, there are worries, I think, in some of the neighboring countries that, that Russia, that Moscow could use this to point fingers at countries such as Georgia, which they've already been doing, hinting at that Georgia supports terrorism uh, against Russia, that it supports some of the separatist movements in the North Caucasus. In other words, it could potentially be whipped up uh, as an anti-foreigner, anti-neighbor um, device in places where Russia wants to exert greater influence, and where, in particular, where it's failing domestically to handle terrorism. So that, that's something I fear on the foreign policy side. With that, I'd like to thank everybody for coming to CSIS today. Uh, again, this briefing will be found later on our website at CSIS.org. Uh, thanks again for coming. And if you have follow-up questions, uh, please feel free to contact us. Thank you.